My name is Bill Whitman. I'm a co-author of this book, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology. We wrote this book to provide students with a practical, service-oriented text. The information in this video series will provide actual troubleshooting situations and service procedures for air conditioning systems. Bill Johnson is the other co-author of this text. And throughout the series, Bill will be discussing several typical service calls. We'll also take you on site to see some real life troubleshooting. There you'll have an opportunity to see where theory meets practice. Let's talk about the problem areas that you're going to get into as an air conditioning technician when you get out into the field. The problem area breaks down into two areas, electrical or mechanical. Now the problem with that is, is sometimes an electrical problem may look like a mechanical problem, or a mechanical problem may be as a, re a result of an electrical problem, or vice versa. For example, suppose we had a restricted air filter, restricted to the point that the refrigerant didn't boil off in the evaporator like it should and some of the liquid trickles back into the compressor crankcase. What this is going to do, of course, is cause oil dilution. Oil dilution will eventually probably throw a rod in the compressor, probably through a motor winding. Now, when you as a technician arrive there, you look at the system, look the system over, and automatically you find out you have a motor burn and you think that's your only problem. But what was the ultimate cause of the motor burn? Anybody? A restricted filter? Restricted filter, that's correct. Now let's go into the field and look at a problem very similar to what we just talked about here. Hot weather, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, has caused this unit to run for the first time this summer. A check of the service ticket reveals that the unit is not cooling and there is no air coming from the registers. The technician determines that this is the first service call made by his company and there is no maintenance contract involved. He further determines that the unit was not installed by his company. A quick look at the unit tells the technician that it is relatively new. The first thing the technician checks is the indoor fan motor. The motor is running. So the air filter is checked and it is found to be severely restricted. The return air filter is located near a paper shredder which has created this condition. The filter is replaced. The technician will recommend that the owner move the paper shredder. The technician checks the suction line and finds ice on it at the condensing unit. The technician sets the thermostat to allow the indoor fan to run while the compressor is off. This will help the system defrost. It will take time for the unit to thaw. The technician will use that time to perform some preventive maintenance measures. These contactors are badly pitted. Some customers will want you to clean and reuse them. However, filing them will remove the silver coating that gives the good contact surface. Removing these silver surfaces often causes the contacts to weld closed. This would cause the compressor to run continuously and possibly to fail. The customer will soon need another surface call to replace the contactors and possibly the compressor. You can also oil the condenser fan motor as a simple preventive maintenance measure. The technician notes that this model is permanently lubricated. About 15 minutes have passed. The coil is thawed and the technician starts the compressor. The line between the metering device and the evaporator seems too cold. There is ice forming. The system is clearly not operating properly. The technician wears goggles and gloves to fasten gauges to the system and check the pressures. The suction pressure is too low for an R22 system. The suction pressure should be around 69 PSIG, corresponding to 40 degrees Fahrenheit evaporator temperature. But this reading is 37 PSIG, corresponding to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. This is below freezing. The head pressure is only 160 PSIG. A proper reading would be about 260 PSIG because we would be condensing at 120 degrees with 85 degree air passing over the condenser. The line is freezing all the way back to the outdoor unit 
and the compressor is sweating, so there is no superheat. This unit cannot have an overcharge of refrigerant, or it would not freeze. Let's discuss the service call that we just saw on the video. The air was too cold coming out of the registers. Our problem in this whole video is, is that we have a restricted airflow. When we notice the cold air coming out of the registers, our next test would be to see how much cold air or to test for how much cold air we have coming out of the registers. And we're going to basically do this without an instrument using a practical test. If air is only coming out of the registers about a foot high, for example, if you can only feel it about a foot high, then you don't have enough airflow. If you can stand over a floor register and feel the cold air up about waist high or a little above waist high, you probably have enough air coming out of that floor register. Now, if a suction line is so cold that when you go up and hold on to it like that, that's a real good sign that there's liquid in the suction line instead of vapor, simply because the liquid will draw the heat out of your hand much faster than vapor, and it'll become painful to hold on to it. If there's vapor in the suction line, when you grip the suction line, your hand will warm up the vapor to the point that it won't be uncomfortable to hold on to it. The compressor in this unit was also sweating all over. A typical compressor should sweat right around the suction line where it enters the, cast, the casing out maybe a couple of inches. This compressor was cold and sweating all down the sides. These two things are indicating that we have liquid refrigerant flowing back into the compressor. Most of the units of today are, have a critical refrigerant charge. Most of, that's because most of them use orifice-type metering devices or capillary tube-type metering devices. A critical charge means that this unit has to operate on exactly the prescribed amount of refrigerant that is shipped with the unit. Now, there are ways that we alter the charge in the field accidentally in the name of a service call. For example, suppose you go out to a unit like we looked at just in this past video, and we got confused and we thought, well, this unit looks like it has an overcharge of refrigerant. And we attach our gauges to it. We attach our high side gauge to the liquid line, and this is about a five foot high side gauge. When this gauge line condenses full of liquid refrigerant, it will hold about an ounce of liquid refrigerant. This unit is probably critical to a half an ounce of charge. And by just attaching the gauge, we take out an ounce of refrigerant. So we have altered the charge to the point that the system is now out of balance by trying a service technique. Now, what would le lead you to believe that this unit did not have an overcharge of refrigerant? What did we see that would lead you to believe that this unit did not have an overcharge of refrigerant? Anybody? Because the line was too cold for an overcharge? Very good. That's the correct answer. Excellent. The experienced technician fastens gauges only after a complete touch test. The cold suction line and compressor will verify that the unit has enough refrigerant. This technician will use experience and patience to put the facts together into a complete service picture. Let's take a moment to review the facts. The unit was frozen. This could have been caused by undercharge, dirty air filters, low airflow, a dirty coil, or a defective metering device. The first step was to thaw the unit while looking for the problem. While the unit thawed, restricted filters were found and replaced. Since the filters were dirty, the technician suspected correctly that the coil was dirty. After thawing the coil, the next step was to start the unit. Note that the line leaving the metering device was extremely cold. Do not make the mistake of thinking undercharge. We have determined that the refrigerant is not boiling to a vapor in the coil. Our technician has also noted that the coil is dirty and the fan is dirty. A dirty fan must be removed and cleaned. The evaporator fan motor may be oiled at this time if needed. The coil can be cleaned by removing the coil compartment door and applying coil cleaning detergent to the coil. Sometimes the coil needs to be removed for adequate cleaning. Once all panel screws are in place, the system is ready for startup. The only step left is to run the unit and check the system. The system is then touch tested. The suction line is cold but warms up to the touch 
indicating that it has vapor rather than liquid in it. The compressor is cold where the suction line enters the shell and warms outward from that point. The compressor is hot below the oil level. Everything appears normal. Gauge line refrigerant loss has been a problem for years. Manufacturers have developed several small valves that can be used to prevent this loss. Notice the valve at the end of this high pressure charging hose. It can serve two purposes. We have the gauge manifold fastened to the system with the valve fastened to the high pressure gauge port. Now with the center hose fastened to the gauge manifold plug, it is blocked off. Watch what happens when the technician opens both gauge manifold valves. The high side pressure dropped to the low side pressure and all the liquid refrigerant was pulled into the low side. Before leaving the system, the technician performs a leak check. Learning about mechanical troubleshooting is an ongoing process. Good reference books and manufacturer's literature will benefit this process, keeping students and instructors abreast of the newest technologies and procedures. Your continuing study of mechanical problem solving is essential to your success as you make the transition from the classroom to the field.